Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our members webinar um, on Offer and Compromise. This webinar is um, brought to you by Canopy. Canopy is a simple yet robust tax resolution and practice management software. It introduces online client surveys for auto population of IRS forms, smart tax analytics, a dynamic client portal, and more. You can try Canopy for free by going to canopytax.com. And Bob, are you there? I'm here. Great. Hopefully and then we have Bob here. McKenzie here to present the webinar. Well, good, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody, those on the West Coast and uh, where I'm at here in Phoenix presenting today. Uh, it's morning, but everybody else is uh, in the afternoon. We're going to go through the basics of offer and compromise, what's happening today, some high points, low points, and, and just doing a good presentation of the idea. So first rule in any time you're doing a collection matter is get the fee first. Offers and compromise are particularly uh, difficult if you don't. Um, I, I do mine on a retainer basis in every case. At one time, I did some contingent fee work. And even though I was successful getting uh, compromises from my clients, they were not inclined to pay me. So uh, I now put it in a client fund account, and I will be paid. But uh, people who don't pay the IRS and have large liabilities that make them eligible for a compromise are not a good credit risk for you. Uh, now, the, just the basic types of compromises that you might uh, do are doubt as to collectability, and that's the primary compromise that many of us do in the arena of tax resolution, and that is, hey, guys, I can't afford to pay you all the money. Let's reach an agreement as to what you think the maximum ability of me to pay is. The next one is done on a separate form, not the normal 656. It's on a 656L, and it's doubt as to actual liability. And that's done when you say, I don't think my client owes this. And I've done it for where I've been denied audit reconsiderations. It is still an option to come in and do an out is to liability offer. I've also done it uh, with respect to trust fund penalties where you don't get the right to go to court immediately and if you, after it's been assessed you must pay, file a refund claim and then if they deny it go to court. This is an option that's less expensive. Um, I won't be spending much time on this but one pointer on 656Ls. Since 1998 the IRS has specifically prohibited from requiring you to submit a financial statement of 433A with the offer and compromise when you're doing a 656L. And the last one is to promote effective tax administrations or exceptional circumstances. That's been in the code since 1998 also. <clears throat> and that's coming in with a full financial statement, but also setting forth extraordinary reasons why your client should get a break even better than the normal doubt as to collectability offer. And the ones that are most prevalent for getting approved are, I'm of advanced age, I'm going to need some of my money available, my IRAs and other assets, my home. In retirement, I'm not going to be making money to mount and hang in the future. Please leave me with some. The other is, I'm severely ill or some family member is severely ill and that impacts my ability to do a proper uh, payment of everything under doubt as to collectability. Please leave me something. And one of the examples used in the regulation specifically references a mother with a very seriously ill child. She has assets, but those assets are going to be needed to care for her child. So those are the type of exceptional circumstances effective tax administration offers that you can do. Uh, since January 2014, when you submit an offer, unless your client earns below the levels of what are considered two and a half times poverty, and we'll go through that in a bit, you must also submit that compromise with a $186 payment or it will not be processed. Now, I um, 
cannot give you the statistics from 2015 offers because they haven't come out yet. But since 2012, the offer environment has greatly improved. In 2012, 38% uh, were accepted. 2013, 42%. 40% in 2014, um, that is dramatically up from prior years. So uh, even though it's less than 50% chance, some offers are submitted by taxpayers who don't have a clue. Some offers are submitted by practitioners who don't have a clue. The people on this line, I'm sure, have a clue, know what the rules are at the IRS, and have, will have a better success rate than 40%. But let's look at some historical numbers. If you look back in 2012, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, you'll see that the acceptance rate was about 20 to 25 percent, usually about 25 percent, but in 2009 it was particularly bad. And it's improved dramatically since then with the changes from 2012. And an, another chart just giving you a a trend all the way back, you'll see that the acceptance rate was not great all the way through until this recent change. Now, the first thing that you'd have to know when you're doing a compromise is the allowable expense standards. As you know, the allowable expense standards set this tone for what you must pay, and it's part of the IRS's view of what you must pay in a compromise. There's two levels and a doubt is to collectability compromise. One, what are your um, assets and we determine some value in those and two, we'd like to know how much you can afford to pay per month and an installment offer which goes over 24 months. They want the multiplier whatever is available using the allowable expense standards times 24 so um, if I can afford uh, $1,000 per month they would want the value of my assets plus um, 24 times 1,000 or 24,000 more there's an open poll right now um, and so we should um, respond to that so that you can prove that you are attending today and get your CPE Now, the allowable expense standards, we've set them out in the materials, but the breakdown is there's national standards, there's medical expenses allowed under the code, there's regional standards, there's local standards, which are for housing, and then on top of that, anything that's necessary for production of income or health and welfare of the family. So to get into this a little more depth, uh, we need to know what the standards are and go forward through them in detail. But the standards are available on the IRS website. You can look them up and uh, get the standards as to what they currently are. Usually each March, the IRS revises them. Uh, in the materials, which were included for you, you'll find the standards as they existed in March of last year in which we've been using. And um, so on page 18 of your materials, you'll see the uh, standards for national standards, which are for food, housekeeping, apparel and service, personal care products, miscellaneous, and for a family of four, <coughs> that is $1,513. Now, if you just go to the standards, about $800 for food, $78 for all your housekeeping supplies, anything from uh, dishwasher detergent to uh, washing um, your clothes, washing uh, detergent on down the line. Then you have apparel and services, $244 a month, which run about 60 bucks a month per person in the household. Then you have personal care products and services, which include beauty salon, haircuts for the whole family per month. And then there's $300 a month miscellaneous, and that includes entertainment for the family, paying for the children's 
hobbies and activities anywhere from ballet lessons to for Susie to uh, Little League for um, Junior on down the line and so just thinking of how little this is if the family goes out to a movie in the Chicago area where I am uh, the adult movie ticket is sometimes twelve dollars per person so that's twenty four dollars the children are eight dollars each so you got another sixteen dollars that's forty dollars to go through the door for the movie theater then figure ten bucks for the popcorn five bucks a piece for each of the uh, soda drinks the kids get so that's another thirty dollars on top of that so it doesn't take much to run this up and the same thing happens if the family goes out to McDonald's you can run up a $35 bill to go out to McDonald's and have burgers and uh, kids meals so the total $1,513 a month the interesting thing with this is the standards are the same any place in the 50 United States so that certainly those of you who have been to Hawaii realize that the expenses are much higher in Hawaii than they might be in Jackson Mississippi same thing with the difference between my city of Chicago and New York I can go to Perry's Deli in Chicago and get a wonderful corned beef sandwich piled high with a uh, Diet Coke it'll cost me about 13 bucks uh, when I walk into a deli in Manhattan it'll cost me 25 bucks for the same thing and there is no change just because of where you live at one time they did no longer so it creates hardship for many people then we go to the cost of out-of-pocket medical expenses and the IRS said these are expenses that are not your insurance related expenses it's all the miscellaneous expenses that each of us have if you're under six under 65 you get 60 bucks a month Per child and person so a family of four two hundred and forty dollars a month that's a plug number if the, uh, your proponents for the offer are over 65 they get 144 that accounts for everything from the co-pays to dental work so if I go to in to see a doctor I own and I have an insurance policy there's a, normally a 15 20 or 30 dollar copay for the on reimport first part of that visit to a doctor when I go to a, a pharmacy and pick up a medication there's always a cost that's out of pocket and they recognize that senior citizens have more out-of-pocket medical expenses than other now this is the baseline so if you have two retired people and it's two hundred and eighty eight dollars a month for the two of them they're over 65 but let's posit that their out-of-pocket are much greater in that case you will have to prove it with all the receipts and documentation if in fact it is not greater than 144 you'll get the 144 as a plug number now we move down to transportation which are the regional expenses that's number C on your uh, slide and you'll see that for each car you get five hundred and seventeen dollars a month to pay the payments on the car which could be lease payments or payments on the uh, repayment of the car loan then for each area of the country they have a general amount for each region the Northeast the South the Midwest and the West and then for particular large metropolitan areas in the area you'll have an amount so in the Northeast you'll note that you'll get 278 a month if you're out of the metropolitan area of Boston out in western uh, Massachusetts or up in New Hampshire Maine uh, Vermont but in Boston you'll get a little less you get 277 New York much higher 342 Philadelphia 299 we go to the Midwest you'll see that those people not living in large metropolitan areas like Chicago Cleveland Detroit Minneapolis will get 212 a month now what does this number include for one car it's everything related to the car's expense licensing repairs maintenance tires parking everything else and so it's not going to fit real well the, the worst case scenario would be a family where we have mom and dad who are uh, in their 
mid thirties or early forties. They have two children, both of whom are drivers. They're both over 16, both have a driver's license. And we know that the car insurance is going to dramatically raise for that family, but there isn't an adjustment in these charts. Now let's move on to the next set of charts and that's for housing. In, on the ARS website, you'll find that there's housing allowances for every single county in the United States. So if we look at the one I've included on page 21, uh, you'll take a relatively uh, low income county like Glades County and you'll find a family of four gets $1,368 a month for all cost of housing. Now if they're renting, that would include all their rent all their utilities if they're buying a home that would include their uh, house payments their taxes the repairs and maintenance and utilities on the home but if you look at a county that is a lot more affluent like miami dade you'll see that that same family living there would get twenty three hundred dollars per month and the ours gets these statistics from the bureau of labor statistics and once again, there's flaws in these statistics because they average all housing in the county, including in Miami, they'd have the single occupancy residence, or in other words, the hotels where poor people go and are very low, uh, tiny room residencies, the motels, the rundown neighborhoods. Those averages are included with the nice homes in the area, so, and it also includes Section 8 subsidies holds housing so that somebody who receives a federal subsidy for the rent, uh, it will not, it will be included at the lower amount in the rents. So this also creates hardships for younger families which have recently purchased their home versus the retired people who may have owned their home for decades and the mortgage payment and the taxes are much lower. But again, every county in the United States and then the last portion of this is we have uh, local standards, which are the housing. Then we go to necessary for production of income and health and welfare of the family. And what's for production of income? Well, the first and easiest is a 2106. If your client is taking on reimbursed business expenses as an employee, that's it's the start of what they have to spend to maintain their income. They may have some they can't claim but are true expenses. For example, you may have somebody who has a professional license like an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, and it's not reimbursed by their employer but is certainly necessary to produce income. Health and welfare, first of all and foremost, is health insurance. So this is in addition to the out-of-pocket expenses, whatever amount your client has to pay for health insurance per year is included. And with the um, Affordable Care Act, many, many more people will have this expense since more than 10 million more people are covered by insurance. You'll need to get proof of the true out-of-pocket cost of your client for that. Now, some things are debatable, like what's necessary for production of income. An example of one I fought a few years ago. My client was a financial planner who couldn't manage to manage his own affairs, owed a few hundred thousand dollars to the IRS. Among his expenses were country club dues. The IRS said that's discretionary. We're not going to allow that. It has to fit within the national standards. And my argument was that's where he meets clients. He belongs to the country club and goes there in order to find clients to do financial planning for. And my glib response when they said we don't accept that was where do you want him to get clients? At the local methadone clinic or at a country club where wealthy and upper middle class people go? After some dispute, we were allowed that. Um, health and welfare of the family, another thing, life insurance policy you get but only to the extent of the cost of term policy since whole life has a savings component, they're not going to allow that. So you're going to have to come up with an equivalent. Now, with that all being said, let's just summarize allowable expenses. 
you'll never be told by an offer examiner by the IRS that you can bargain about these. But you, within the Internal Revenue Manual, it says they can look at the individual facts and circumstances of the taxpayer. And in the Internal Revenue Code, they can look at the individual facts and circumstances of the taxpayer. So if I'm representing somebody in a high cost area, LA, New York, I'm going to argue that the standards don't fit people who live in those communities. It's much more expensive to live there than Jackson, Mississippi, uh, the capital of the poor state in this country. And so you, the practitioner, have to recognize that you can bargain, there is discretion, and there's a statutory requirement that they consider that. Medical expenses, as I mentioned before, if your client has more than the plug amount of $60 per month per person, you got to submit the expenses. The regional expenses for cars. If you have that family with teenage children, you have to argue that the expenses are not reasonable for the facts and circumstances of your client's case, and therefore the Internal Revenue Code should be applied with respect to the regional standards. Same thing with local standards. Um, there's an example that if you live in one county on the border, you may have much lower allowance than just across the border. Why would that happen? Well, if you are in a county that has both poor people and wealthy people, the average may be driven down a bit, where if you have a county adjacent in a suburban area where mainly there are middle class, upper middle class, and wealthy people, that uh, community that's adjacent to that county will get much higher. And so you have to use those types of things to argue for whatever you can gain above the standards. So the most effective thing that any good practitioner does is argue for something more than the standard allows. Because for every $100 you get extra, it's going to save your client $2,400 on most compromises. Next one. Be aware that you have to use the 2015 offer and compromise form. If you use anything that was published beforehand, it's going to be returned. Uh, included in the form is a waiver of the requirement that you make a down payment. And on your materials, you'll find a copy of that waiver in the 656. And uh, I'll go to the page right now on page 41, you'll find that if your client has a family of four and lives in the contiguous United States, that uh, they can make up to $4,969 per month gross and seek a waiver of the offer and compromise fee. So certainly you need to check that box at section four on page 41 if your client is below that. And then you'll see that for Hawaii, they do recognize in Hawaii that it takes a lot more to live in Hawaii than it does in the continental United States. So they'll give a waiver for hardship uh, for $5,700 and $15 per month. In Alaska, which is even more expensive, expensive it's a quarter, more than 25% uh, higher, they'll give 62.13. Now, if you're arguing about the $1,500 a month allowed for national expenses. This is a compelling argument that in a state like Alaska, you're getting at least 25% more, and you should be arguing again when we go back to arguing the allowable expense standards that you need more because of the high cost of living in um, Alaska. Now, in 2012, I referenced that uh, in the uh, beginning on page 24, there's a breakout of the changes that came out in 2012, and those changes have made it a lot easier to get compromises. We saw the 38% in 2012, even though it wasn't a partial, was only a partial year where these rules were in effect. We saw the increase in acceptance in 2013, and again in 2014. So. Let's go to a summary of those changes, and then we'll go through the detail. One, it revised the calculation of future income for OICs, expanded allowable expense categories, which means your clients get more expenses than were allowed 
pre-2012. It liberalized the valuation of vehicle vehicles. It liberalized the valuation of assets used in business. It reduces um, the use of a dissipated asset theory. I'll talk about each of these in depth. And it reduces the multiplier for determining future income component of RCP, the reasonable collection component. So with that, let's move to the next slide and go to the first one. Valuation of assets. You'll see that as a general rule, uh, the equity and in income producing property will not be considered in valuing uh, it if the assets, unless the assets are not critical to the business. And the best example I've used for the last three years on this or so is the following. My client runs a trucking company. He has four trucks. And to make this an easy problem, each of those trucks are worth 25000 each, and there is no encumbrance on those trucks. Under the old rules, pre-2012, the heirs would discount those $100,000 in rolling stock to 80000 and the minimum amount on the offer on those assets would be 80000 Under the current rules, because those trucks are the assets that produce the business's income, the IRS will assign no RCP to those trucks. Therefore, they go from 80000 for purposes of compromise to zero. But now, let's distinguish. It says not critical to the business is the test here. Let's go to this. That same trucking company with four trucks has a junk truck out behind the uh, garage where he repairs and fixes his truck. It's worth 4000 bucks. It isn't run a boat, but what's he use it for? Well, if a starter goes out on one of the trucks, he pulls a junk starter out of the junk truck and puts it on his current running truck, saving money. If a tire blows out, he goes and takes a tire off that truck, and that saves money. But it's not operating. It's not critical to the business. Therefore, if that truck is worth um, $4,000, the IRS is going to assign it a value of $3,200. So you can have the situation where $100,000 in operating trucks have no value, and a junk truck worth $4,000 is assigned a value for compromise for the reasonable collection potential of that asset of $3,200. And then let's go to the second issue. The old rule on bank accounts is they would do an average of three year, three months of how much you had ending balance in your bank account, and that would become the balance. So let's take a situation like this. Three months ago, the client had $6,000 at the end of the month in her bank account. Many, much of it flowed. The following month, she had 5000 And the third month, when you're preparing the financials, she only has 4000 Well, instead of accepting 4000 for the value, IRS would add the three together, six plus five plus four, $15,000, divide by three, and the taxpayer would be assigned a value of $1,000. With the new rules, though, automatically, the IRS will subtract $1,000 from that $5,000, and then they go to what is the amount of agreed upon allowable expenses of the client family. So if, in fact, the client had $5,000 using the IRS convention. They get a $1,000 reduction, and if they have $3,200 in allowed expenses per month for the family, the total reduction of that $5,000 account will be $4,200, and your client will have only $800 value for that. I, I encountered um, a review matter that some another practitioner asked me to review on an RCP the other day, and I was asked to review the RCP, and the first thing the uh, revenue officer investigator had failed to do is reduce the operating assets of the business, which were worth about $80,000. And right off the top, she had included that in the amount of the RCP. We then moved to the bank account. She hadn't applied the requirements of the $1,000 reduction or the amount of allowable expenses. We picked up another $5,000 there. Now let's move to the next thing. Reduce the value of vehicles 
plains and assets used to produce income or for health and welfare of the family. Now these are not planes that you're out doing as a hobby. They're not boats that you use for recreational purposes. It's a needed for the family. And so in most cases, you can argue for two vehicles for a, a family of four with a husband and wife each needing a car to do the family uh, duties. Even if it's a non-working spouse, he or she is going to need to drive children to the doctor, drive children to activities. So let's take an example. Car number one, um, worth $20,000. Amount owed on it, $15,000. Well, how would that be valued? Let's take that. $20,000 car reduced by 20%, that's $16,000. Subtract 15,000 encumbrance, it's got a $1,000 value, but then you get up to $3,450 reduction. Now let's take the second car, which is much less value. That car is worth $6,000, it's fully paid for. Discounted, it goes down to 20%. 20% of $6,000 takes it down to $4,800, subtract $3,450, and for purposes of the value of assets, you have $1,350 is all that's left there. So that's the math, and not all the IRS employees tell you that that's the rules they operate under. It's up to you, in some cases, to spot those mistakes. Now the next concept is dissipated assets theory. And the theory of that is you either spent too much money or wasted too much money and we're going to add it back into your assets. And so uh, an example where the IRS appropriately did that is I represented a person who had a tax shelter liability. He would received a large amount of money from the sale of his business. He sheltered all of that income by take, buying a shelter from one of the big four county firms, which didn't work. He eventually owed them millions of dollars. But having taken his money from the company, he then moved to Vegas and gambled a lot of it away. That would be dissipated assets. Now, the one thing is the heirs can only look back three years now. Another one where they tried that um, for me is my client faced a $50 million tax liability from 1999 taxes. While he had sold his company, he'd made a large profit on it. He bought a tax shelter. He didn't pay taxes in 99. The IRS found the tax shelter. They eventually audited him. It took them years to get the liability agreed to, but he owed with penalties, interest, and tax about $50 million. Well, in, uh, when he sold his company in 99, he put the money into the market in dot-com companies and lost a lot of money. He'd gotten about 80 or $90 million in the sale of his business. It dissipated. Then a couple years later, he went through a very torturous divorce and half his money was given to his um, ex-spouse. So that reduced his assets. In the 2008-9 crash, he once again lost money. And so by the time we were making a compromise, he was down to four or five million dollars in assets from having had this large amount of money. The IRS argued that one, that the drop in the market in 2009, he should, I'm sorry, in 2000 when the dot-com crash came, he should have anticipated that, that that was a dissipated asset. So he argued that giving his ex-spouse uh, half of his assets of the divorce was dissipated assets. Both of those were erroneous arguments and they were not bad faith use of the money, but the better argument I had on those is more than three years ago. Now, what about the 99 crash? Well, once again, the assets did not recover at the time I was doing the offer in 2014 and the IRS it asserted that that 99 crash was dissipation. The appeals officer found it not to be. The 401k exception. In the past, I've had clients who came out with only their IRA or 401ks after they'd lost their business. And those were exempt from being taken in bankruptcy, but they are assets can be seized by the IRS. So I've had clients who couldn't find a job 
took the money out of their 401k and started a business, paid the taxes that were due for that withdrawal, and the IRS before 2012 would argue that was dissipation of assets, and if I take client had taken on a hundred thousand dollars, they would take into account the taxes that were paid, which could be thirty thousand in this case for penalties and everything, and then they would say that that seventy thousand had to be added into their assets, but. Under the current regime, if that money went out to go into an investment in business that was there to produce income from him, they would not claim it. it is a dissipated asset. Let's move on. So the other part that is important, we went to the allowable expense standards, but for the purposes of consideration of offers and com compromise, there's several other expenses that they're allowing now that were not allowed before 2012, student loans. I've had doctors that I've represented who are making $300,000 a year, but they're paying uh, $20,000 a year toward their student loans. And prior to 2012, the IRS would disallow all those payments on the student loans, even though the major reason they were able to earn that nice salary was because they had student loans that educated them to become a doctor. Payments to state agencies proportional. So if I owe 50000 to the uh, state and 500000 to the feds for a total of $550,000, uh, whatever the allowable expense standard that I end up with allowable expenses available proportionally there should be separated out um, 50 over the total amount owed of 550 times the amount available in the person's budget to be allocated to state payments. Chart card payments. Up until 2012, my client could be paying $500 a month in charge card payments, and the IRS would not allow them. They are now. Another thing they have changed with this 2012 is they used to, if I had a client whose car had been a five-year note to pay it off and he's on the last year payments, they would only consider in his budget the car payments until full paid. They now will consider that the likely event is after five years, the taxpayer will have to get another car and so they'll project his payments as having been payable into the future at the same rate. So if you were paying $500 a month for a car that will be paid off in six months, they won't stop the budget at six months. They'll assume that you'll find a replacement car. Um, and then if you have an older car, six years older or older, so it, if you have a cl client who has a 2010 or prior vehicle, they automatically will get $200 per month extra in their budget above the allowable expense standards for that car. And if you have a newer car, but it, they, it has been driven a lot, it's out of warranty essentially, it's at 75,000 miles, you should take a picture of the odometer reading so you can prove to the IRS that the car has mileage above 75,000 and it will give you an, an extra $200 a month for your client. Now, I mentioned this before, but I want you to know the code section. When you're bargaining for allowable expense standards, certainly we take everything the IRS lists. But on top of that, uh, when I go to bargain with appeals, because a lot of times I don't have success with the offer specialist, I bring a copy of 7122C2B, and it says it's legal for the IRS to have these allowable expense standards but shall not use the schedules to the extent that such schedules use would result in a taxpayer not having adequate means to provide basic living expenses. So let's go back to my argument before. I live in New York City. I don't, I live in Chicago, but if my client does, my expenses are greater than Des Moines, Iowa. There's a standard chart for the country it's going to create hardships for the taxpayer's family unless we get more for those expenses. In housing, there's all types of arguments, including I live in an apartment near my work, therefore my commuting expense, which is necessary for production of income, 
is less because of that. Therefore, give me extra for my housing. So these are areas that you have to be creative, but again, this bargaining starts at the allowable expense standards, but you're not doing your job unless you do your best to try to raise those expenses up because of this code section and because of the vicissitudes of the differences in cost from Alaska to Chicago to Jackson, Mississippi, and there's huge variances around the country, and you should be alert to those variances and argue them aggressively, because yes, there's some upward movement on the cost for housing, probably not adequate because of the way they do it, so you can argue hardship there. There's some upward adjustment for the cost of a car, but once again, probably not enough to count its true cost of the keeping the car on the road. Now, TIPRA required that if you made a lump sum offer, you had to put 20% down. Folks, I don't make 20% down offers. I don't make a lump sum offer, uh, which is uh, five or fewer payments. Why? Because I view putting 20% of your offer down incentivizes the IRS rejecting the compromise because if they reject it they get to keep the 20 percent so let's take an example your client owes two hundred thousand dollars you're offering fifty thousand to settle if you make a lump sum offer you're putting ten thousand bucks at risk I don't do that now you do get a little advantage on how much will be owed by doing a lump sum offer but since the IRS only accepts 40 percent of offers 60 percent of the time in a lump sum offer, they're keeping the money. And I don't want to explain that to my clients. So I use the periodic payment offer, which is payments of more than five payments. And in that case, I have to start making payments. And the general rule is I'll make small payments with an offer of a lump sum in 24 months. So that same $50,000 offer, I will come in and say, my client will pay two fifty dollars a month with a lump sum in 24 months. If I did a lump sum offer, my client would lose $10,000 on that $50,000 offer. If I do a installment offer, periodic payment offer, and my client has paid 10 months of payments and then gets rejected, she loses $2,500, which is a lot better than losing $10,000. So. Again, I do not ever submit at the beginning a lump sum offer. And the next thing you should know is you can tell the IRS where to apply payments. And here's the reasons you want to do that. You may not be successful in your offer, but you are making payments. So simple situation. Your client owes 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011 taxes. Generally, income taxes that are over three years old can be discharged in bankruptcy. So if I'm sending in a payment to the IRS as part of my offer, I don't want the payments applied to an amount I may be able to go bankrupt on later. I want to apply it to the newest liability. So in that hypothetical I just posited, I would send in a 656 PPV and I would note on the check and on the 656 PPV partial payment voucher that I wanted the the payments being made applied to 2014. Therefore, if things go badly, my client will have gotten a benefit toward the liability that could not be discharged in bankruptcy for quite some time. So here's some examples of how I do them. Your client, um, the new rules have changed how the IRS does the multiplier. So in the old rules with five or fewer, the multiplier used to be 48. So the example I give before 2012, if your client could afford $300 per month, the IRS would demand for the future income component another $14,400 above 
to value their assets. Under the current rules, they would demand $3,600, a substantial reduction. But when I'm doing uh, six or more payments, which is my offers, the old math used to be $300 per month um, times 60, and now it's $300 a month times 24, so the amount goes down from $18,000 to $7,200. Um, but in the changes of the rules, we no longer can take more than 24 months to pay. But that 24 months is measured from the date they accept. So if I do 250 a month, and 10 months later they accept my compromise, I can keep paying 250 for the next 23 months before I pay the lump sum. Some periodic offers, $100 a month, we're making an offer of $25,000 a month, balloon in 24th month, if you get rejected in nine months, your client loses $900. Offer of $10,000 a month, um, pay $200 per quarter, because it doesn't require the payments to be monthly under the periodic offers, it just requires there's six more. So if you're doing uh, $200 a month, uh, for seven quarters, that's more than six payments with a lump sum, you can do that. Do not submit lump sum offers as they incentivize the heirs to reject the offer and keep the down payment. The better option is make a periodic offer. If you get to an agreement as to the full value with the IRS, and I generally do this in appeals, I say, if I switch over to a lump sum offer now, we've agreed on everything, will you reduce the multiplier from 12, from 24 to 12? And in most cases, appeals is perfectly willing to do that. Now your client has to have the ability then to quickly raise the money. And they also have to immediately true up to the 20% down payment. But I've done that as an option, and I've had times where appeals said they would not we had an agreement on everything, but they didn't trust my client to make payments for 24 months. And they've come back and said they wanted to change to a lump sum offer. So again, don't do it up front, only when you believe you have a deal. Now there is some level of trust, but I haven't had an appeals settlement officer yet withdraw from a deal where we switch from installment to lump sum. Now the counter argument that I get that is the worst from the IRS, the, the IRS reserves the right to compute the RC pay value for the remaining statute of limitations for collection. As you know, the statute of limitations for collection is 10 years. So if I'm submitting an offer on a liability that's only two years old, and they come up with a thousand dollar per month that my client can afford to pay, if they believe they can project full payment within the remaining 96 months available for them to collect, they can come back and say, we're not doing a compromise, even though our standard would be to multiply by 24, we're gonna use 96 as a, uh, an argument. Now I've successfully overcome that in appeals sometimes, but not everything. But this is the biggest impediment to OICs when you have a newer liability and they can do these projections over a long period of time. Um, it actually gives advantage to my clients who really screw up and run up large liabilities because even with budgeting, they can't pay it within the statute. But some of the arguments you can use on older liabilities that counter this is one, Yes, you can say it's going to, my client's going to make payments for 96 months, but guess what? He's going to be eligible to go bankrupt in another year. It's been filed for two years, and you think he's going to keep paying payments for 96 months when he can go bankrupt. IRS, it's a better option to make this deal, and it's a good argument against it. Second one, my client is 64 years old you think that she can continue working for another eight years. That's not reasonable. Therefore, you have to reconsider this projections of the statute or my client's 55 but has a severe heart condition. No one can bet that she will survive for the next eight years. Again, you can, and then lastly 
if you have these Asian health problems, your offer should be going and checking the box for doubt as to collectability and as to effective tax administration. So, summary of what we just covered, um, I, I'm sure in 2011 some of the changes the IRS made is uh, they streamlined offer and compromise, they raised the level. It went up from 25000 owed to 50000 So if you have a client who has a relatively modest liability, you send it in with a letter saying this is being sent, submitted as a streamlined offer. You write streamlined on the top of the form 656. Those generally will be reviewed in either Holtzville or Memphis and not sent out to the field for further investigation. And they'll move faster through the system. Now, the reason the IRS set the $50,000 level is, by law, any compromise of a liability more than $50,000 has to be approved by their lawyers. And any time we lawyers get involved in something, it's never going to move fast. So therefore, if you have that small liability, the taxpayer can't have income above 100000 per year, period. And the liability has to be below 50000 but it is an option that will speed up the process. For the larger liabilities that I generally represent, it's taking well more than a year to get through the system. So in 2000. 10, they did some more changes too, which are good for you to know. They don't always use three year averaging when it would not be appropriate of income. An example I had back before then is a realtor who in 2006 was making 125,000 a year. In 2007 was making 80,000 a year. In 2008, when the crash was full scale, she made 20,000. The IRS averaged the three together divided by three. This 2010 initiative requires them to look at their current income and the potential for future income. And it certainly, when I had that offer pending in 2009 for my client who owed taxes for eight, seven, and six, mainly for six when things were good, it wasn't fair to average those three years because 2006 was an extraordinary time in the uh, housing market. Certainly 2008 was an extraordinary in the opposite direction. But now, as of 2010 and continue, you can argue against this averaging of income. Now, where it's appropriate, I represent uh, commodities traders. And frankly, their income jumps up and down all the time. And it's not inappropriate for the IRS to do uh, income averaging. They're also the IRS is, was suggested that they look at people who are unemployed and if it looks like they're going to stay that way to suggest that a compromise may be appropriate and certainly income averaging wouldn't be appropriate for somebody who's lost his job and it may not get a good job again. Okay, some things that the IRS may come back at you or make you do to get a deal. The IRS now can come back and suggest you give them a future income collateral and um, What's that? Well, they may say, well, the value of your assets are $20,000. But you come up and they say, well, you think you can afford $2,000 a month. And you can say as an alternative, instead of doing the multiplier of 2,000 times 24, how about I give you a percentage if I earn over a certain amount. If my client looks like he's going to start making more money, you will probably do better with the future income collateral. That's one option. I've also had them know as a way to negotiate around the 96 months I talked about before the projection over the time is to say, let's use the current multiplier for 24 months, but we'll give you a collateral agreement that if he makes over a certain month in any year over the next five years, we'll give you a percentage of it. So you have the money right now to settle but you have the upside if my client starts doing better. Now, I don't lay this out as a first instance usually, but if they come back and say, no, we want 96 months of payments or 84 months of payments and we think you can pay it and we're not going to give you a deal, one way to counter that is to come back with this future income collateral. And before they use income averaging again, we discussed that again with respect to my realtor. 
they have to look at all the circumstances should be considered as to whether their income may return to the high income they had before. Uh, the facts and circumstances, they must clarify, clearly explain the reasoning behind their actions in any narrative. Uh, there are cases that may be appropriate to use the tax for current income and secure future income collateral where it looks like they're going to jump up. And the classic of that would be a young man who's a intern, a doctor who's doing an intern. We know that over the next few years his income is going to go up dramatically. And even though he owes a lot of money and is making a modest uh, income right now, the IRS is probably going to demand that future income collateral. For corporate trust funds, be aware that the IRS will require anybody who's potentially liable to sign agreeing to the trust fund recovery penalty before they will consider an offer at the corporate level. Post signing, that person can pay the employee amount for one period and file a claim for refund, but they won't process the corporate one unless each of the potentially responsible officers sign as a responsible person on the 2751 form. Uh, so the future income collateral, example here, client earns 250 years, might make a collateral in little cash value going forward. Again, I don't offer that, but if I'm getting resistance at some level, I sometimes get into that negotiation. So um, some examples where they probably are going to demand it. An engineer currently employed as a salesman, earning less than half his prior salesman due to the difficulty in attaining a job in his field. Uh, they might say, okay, we'll do it on the current income, but we bet he's going to go back to earning more money. A taxpayer as a student is expected to graduate soon. Almost always say they're going to demand a future income collateral. So there are also collateral agreements I've had demanded on net operating losses. What's that? Uh, net operating loss, my client has on his tax return a $100,000 loss that he's carrying forward as a result of the loss of his business. Many times in return for giving a compromise, the IRS is going to demand that they give up those losses. The same thing with capital losses left over from the failure of the business. Another one is passive activity losses. Another one I've had is my client has a rental building. It's worth $200,000. He owes $190,000 on it. There's no equity. But he's also got a basis of $125,000 in that building. I've had the IRS say, because we're giving you a substantial deal on the compromise, uh, you must uh, you must give us a collateral agreement taking your basis from 125 to zero. Um, I'm sorry, folks, for the ringing phone. I do not have a do not disturb on my phone today. Um, and then also in this in negotiation, if your client is eligible to go bankrupt on all or part of the liability and you want to try to argue for something below the RCP, the reasonable collection potential, my best argument is to say I'm going to go bankrupt. Now, the heirs doesn't have to accept that. Their manual says if they believe your client really would go bankrupt, they can take an offer below the amount of the RCP. So keep that in mind because it is a bargaining tool. And um, 2009, they had a couple of things they did and made it easier when you default. They now send you a threatening letter saying if you don't make up for the default and a compromise, um, they're going to kick you out of it. Before that, I had a case called David Trout where he screwed up. He'd saved hundreds of thousands of dollars on a compromise. He didn't pay $350, and that's $350 to the IRS in a subsequent year during the five years after acceptance compromise. They defaulted him. We argued it shouldn't be. We went to court on a CDP. The court said it didn't matter how low the default was. If your client screws up, the IRS can default it. But as of 2009, they are a little more flexible for clients if they correct the default quickly. So with that, have a less taxing year. Uh, I'll take all the questions you want to ask now. So go ahead, let's get the questions that have come in, and we'll answer those. Uh, Julie? Okay, we have a question. Can you comment on using the forced 
sale value of a residence in an offer? Uh, I've had very little uh, success in that. I've tried, but almost always they want the quick sale value, which is 20% discount. I've tried, to, and there are special circumstances, particularly if my client's in foreclosure or something where I can argue it's going to be a for sale value. My client isn't going to be able to make up his mortgage. But uh, absent that, it doesn't work real well. Okay, and then the next question is, I have a client that is a car salesman. He is required to have an auto by employer. Would his car be considered an income producing asset? I, I could argue that, uh, that he should be allowed that car as an income producing asset. Uh, then it would come down to how much does he use it for personal use versus business use. And um, I could see a revenue officer who says it's 50-50, then we're going to keep 50% of the RCP, the reasonable collection potential of that car, because that's your personal use, and we'll discount 50% because it's producing income. Okay, and what about medical when the taxpayer owes, let's say, 200000 in medical expenses? No payment plan has been agreed to with the service provider. Well, if there's no payment plan, the IRS's view is generally we are prior to the uh, claim of any general creditor like a medical facility for 200000 And uh, if your client wants to get out of that, let him go bankrupt. Um, I haven't had them saying, okay, we're going to allow for this. Now, if a judgment has been taken and your client is paying pursuant to a judgment, you have a good argument. If a judgment is taken and a lien is perfected ahead of the IRS, then at least with respect to the value of his assets, subject to the state exemptions allowed against that judgment, uh, you could argue that those assets are in fact the IRS is primed and therefore um, the um, they should reduce the RCP by the amount of assets that are primed by the judgment lien, but if it's just a general claim by a medical providers, uh, I haven't had any success in getting them to reduce what my client had to pay uh, on the compromise. Okay, and are payments on a personal loan an allowable expense? I'll put them on the budget, but generally no. Okay, and then our last question will be, would you do an ETA offer for a 68-year-old with some home equity and small amount of excess monthly income? Well, the next question I'd ask is, is he, he or she still working? But yes, when I get to a 68-year-old, I usually do ETA along with uh, doubt as to collectability and offer something less than what the RCP may be for uh, collectability because it's reasonable to assume that uh, 68 year olds are going to wind down in their earning capacity and they're going to need some of the money. Um, the problem with ETAs is you can never fully estimate what you're going to have to pay. So for example, I did ETAs on a couple who were in their 70s. They had over $500,000 in assets available for RCP and if they'd have been just doing the doubt as to collectability, the IRS would have wanted that. But then if they're going to apply ETA, how much does that get to then? What the IRS's solution was, and the only thing I could get at appeals was, we'll, disc, we'll take one half the value of that 500000 in assets to settle this million dollar liability of your client. My client was able to get a reverse mortgage on her home, uh, his and her home, and we were able to pay off the IRS and settle the liability. But there is no magic formula when you get to ETA. It's whatever is the perception of it. The IRS is fair, and you can try arguing uh, with management, but that was the deal we took in that case. So ETA is a, is a very difficult determination of what's fair if you can get to an ETA settlement. Okay. Anything else coming? Okay. I appreciate everybody attending. Uh, go out and make those offers, but make sure you're at some level where you can qualify. Don't just submit them like some of these uh, tax resolution firms that advertise on radio and TV so they can collect their $5,000 fee. They submit compromises that would never, ever qualify.
We're professionals. ASGPS encourages professionalism. Certainly, I'm never going to make an offer right at what the IRS RCP would be. I'm going to come in below that. Why? Because even though their manual and the booklets they give you say you got to be right at their RCP, that's not what the Internal Revenue Code provides. We have the ability and skill to argue something lower than that. So do that. You'll make some money doing this. Thank you for attending today. Julie, thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, for anybody else who had any unanswered questions, we will do our best to send an email answering those. Or if you have any other questions you would like answered, you can email those in as well. And for anybody wanting to take advantage of the webinar discounts available to you for other offer courses that we've run, you can email the order form in the handout to julie at ASTTF.org or mitchell at ASTTF.org. Thanks.